How's it going? Here in the room, as well as online, in our classic venue and on our Moon campus. My name is Steve, and we're in a message series on the book of James. As we just celebrated earlier in the service, Veterans Day is this Monday. And as you'll see, that just couldn't be more appropriate to the passage we'll be looking at in James today. Because, as we all know, military conflict is just a fundamental fact of human life. As long as there's been humans on the earth, there have been wars. Simon Jenkins, a British author, notes that every generation has its war. World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, the Afghanistan War, and many, many more before that, with some occurring today, of course, in Israel as well as Ukraine. And likely there will be many, many more to come, unfortunately. As we just discussed in Revelation, at the end of time, there are still going to be wars and the ultimate battle of Armageddon. And as Jesus described the end of time in Matthew chapter 24, he said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Every generation has its wars. According to the Wall Street Journal, they said that war has shaped the world we live in. And it still is shaping many parts of the globe today. And this is a sad truth for us to contemplate, that entire generations get defined by the wars that they fight. Now, some wars are obviously more famous than the others, right? We've seen all the movies. We see all the ones in popular history and in, and in entertainment and all the stars, um, the ones we studied in school extensively. But I imagine there's some wars that you probably haven't heard about, right? For example, there's a war that's called the Pig War. The Pig War, which was a war in 1859, and that war began over a slaughtered pig that nearly led to a full-scale war between the United States and England, if you can imagine that. And here's how that developed. There's an island off the coast of the state of Washington called the San Juan Island, and at that time, it was home to settlers from both America and Britain. One day, a British pig, hmm, not that it had an English accent of an oink, right? I don't know what that would sound like, but it was owned by a Brit, and that British pig went on a rampage through an American farmer's potato field, entirely destroying the field. And that farmer promptly shot and killed the pig. The British authorities then attempted to arrest that farmer, and then the American authorities called in the army to intervene. A U.S. Army general was then dispatched to assess the situation, and for a variety of reasons, that general and his troops declared San Juan Island to be entirely U.S. property. All of it. And so this, of course, didn't sit well with the Brits, who responded by bringing in a fleet of naval ships to surround the island. And thereon followed a 10-year standoff between the two nations, with various skirmishes, escalations, and de-escalations, and even the direct involvement of the American president, James Buchanan. But historians have suggested that this incident, over the death of a single pig, could very well have blown up into a full-scale war between the U.S. and the English forces. And that's entirely crazy. Here's another one you probably haven't heard about. It's called The War of the Stray Dog. And in this one, after many long years of hostilities between the two nations of Greece and Bulgaria, it all came to a head in October of 1925, when a Greek soldier was shot while chasing his runaway dog across the contested border into the neighboring uh, nation of Bulgaria. He was shot and killed for breaching their border because of his stray dog. And so that's obviously bad, but what's worse is how Greece responded to that act of aggression by engaging in a full-scale full -scale invasion of Bulgaria. And in fact, it got so bad that the League of Nations had to intervene to prevent any further escalation of that war. Pretty, pretty crazy stuff. And then I have just one more for you before we get into the meat of the message today. And it's called The War of Jenkins' Ear. The War of Jenkins' Ear. Any of you ever heard of that one before? 
In 1738, a British sailor named Robert Jenkins stood in front of the British Parliament with a severed ear he claimed was his own, a badly decomposing severed ear. As he indicated, it had been severed off of his head by Spanish soldiers seven years prior. Now, that's some conviction, right? Holding on to your own seven severed year, uh, ear for seven years? That's some conviction. If he's like me and many of the guys here today, I'm sure, he probably kept that ear in that bric-a-bac drawer in the top of his dresser, right? You know that messy drawer? And for some of you, it probably smelled just as bad. And so Jenkins presents his severed ear to the parliament during a time of increased tensions between Spain and England. And England used this incident as just cause to initiate war with Spain, and the war of Jenkins' ear formally was begun. And it lasted nine years over a guy's severed ear. Crazy stuff. And so chapter 3 of James, which Pastor Jeff just discussed with us last week, chapter 3 ends with a strong emphasis on peace. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And now here today, we get into chapter 4, and you're going to notice that James is going to make a very hard right turn. There's going to be a very powerful shift in tone as he enters into uh, James chapter 4. Verse 1, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? And so here in James chapter 4, you will see that James begins by asking us a question. What causes quarrels and fights among you? And he's done this a lot throughout this book, as I'm sure many of you have noticed, asking question after question throughout the first three chapters of James so far. And in this section, he will ask us four different questions. And this was a common form of teaching in the ancient world. The, bra- the rabbis would often teach their students by asking them questions and then providing them with the appropriate answers. This is referred to as the rabbinic method. And similarly, we have the great philosopher Socrates, the great Greek philosopher, and his Socratic method, a form of argumentative dialogue between individuals based on asking and answering questions. And there he would use what was called the diatribo, or the diatribe, asking questions to lead their students along a line of directed reasoning towards some form of dialectical truth. And so James, who appears quite familiar with these teaching techniques, he asks us some questions, and the first of which is about the origins of conflict. What is the source of human conflict? Why all the wars? Why all the strife? Someone once said that the most persistent sound which reverberates through man's history is the beating of war drums. War has been a part of our culture ever since we've been on the earth. It is estimated that within the last 3,400 years of recorded human history, only 268 of those years have been years of peace. What that means is that only less than 8% of the entirety of human history has been time spent without war. So then one could say that peace is the brief moment in history, apparently, when everyone stands around reloading. Right? And here in chapter 4, James will address the nature of all this fighting and strife and warfare. He's going to identify the root cause of all this conflict. What is conflict's true source? So speaking once again of Veterans Day this coming Monday, I myself served in the United States Army. I was a 12 Bravo, which is a combat engineer. And an easy way that we would use to describe that is that we were great at building things, and we were incredibly excellent at blowing those things up. That's what we did. And one of the things that all veterans know so very well is that in the military, there are exhaustive amounts of strategies and tactics policies and procedures 
nomenclatures and SOPs or standard operating procedures. And we would train and train and retrain in all of these procedures, practicing and practicing, drilling and drilling. And the reason we would practice and practice and train and train over and over again is that if and when the bullets started flying, in times of incredible stress and chaos, in all that fear and anxiety, and in all that primal rage and deadly aggression, that in the midst of all of that, we would have been thoroughly and expertly trained not to overreact to all that chaos, but we could react automatically and effectively, calmly and intelligently, maintaining mission readiness and mission awareness, despite all of that deadly conflict we might find ourselves immersed within. And so what we're going to find here in James chapter 4 is, that, is what I'm going to call James's SOP for overcoming conflict in our lives as believers. It's his standard operating procedure for all the conflict and the warring and the strife that we as humans frequently experience. But instead of standard operating procedures, I'm going to refer to these directives from James as our spiritual operating procedures, our special kind of Christian SOP. And the first step in this SOP procedure is recognize the source. Recognize the source. We must recognize the source, the true source of the conflict that we experience in our lives. Verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. I'm sure, we all know people that are quick to fly off the handle, don't we? We all know those people in our lives. Maybe they have a history of trauma, some kind of abuse or neglect, and they've been hardwired to respond violently, emotionally, or even physically violently to any kind of stressful circumstances in their lives. And this can be surprisingly common among Christians, can't it? And why shouldn't it? Christians have certainly experienced our fair share of trauma and abuse in our lives, haven't we? That trauma gets in there and wires you to respond aggressively violently. And I've been around the church for 25 years now, and I've interacted with lots of otherwise very mature believers that given the right circumstances can be triggered. <laughs> they can certainly be triggered. They're talking about scripture and God one moment, and they're emotionally triggered the next. Angry and raging, so ready to fight. I've seen a lot of this. And certainly we all have our lines that can be crossed, don't we? We all have our lines, our blind spots and our vulnerabilities to getting emotionally triggered. I know I do. I certainly do. And so the first thing that strikes us here in this passage is that James says the real problem is not on the outside as much as cable news and social media would like us to believe. It's not on the outside. The conflict isn't because of external reasons, but internal reasons. And those internal reasons are called what? Our sin nature. You'll notice that James asks, where do all of these conflicts come from? Do they not come from your passion or desires for pleasure that war within you? Now look at this word passion very quickly with me. The word for passion here is hedone. And this is where we get the word hedonism. Hedonism. Hedonism is the belief that pleasure is the chief goal of our lives. And we must pause quickly to acknowledge, by the way, that pleasure in and of itself is not a bad thing. God made us to experience pleasure. As 1 Timothy 6.17 tells us, God made all things for us richly to enjoy. So pleasure can be a very, very good thing. Pleasure comes from God. But when pleasure becomes the driving force of your life, the primary focus of your life, so that life is one continuous search for pleasure, that can become very, very problematic very quickly. 
then we become like what Paul described in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where the people are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Or when we become like Paul described in Titus 3, those who were enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Have you ever been enslaved to passion and pleasure before? Do you know people that have been? I'm sure you do. And so James says that war is simply the extension of humanity's struggle with sin. And when the war, there is a war going on on the inside of us, it's going to spill inevitably over into war on the outside of us. And so where do these quarrels and fights and wars come from? What is the true source of the conflict, capital C conflict, that we experience in the world around us and in our lives? So let's go back and look more closely at this passage and take a special notice of the personal pronouns that James is using here. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Are you getting the picture? What is the main source of conflict in the world? You are. (laughs) You are. It comes from within you. You are the source of the conflicts that we have with one another. It's like Jesus said in Matthew 7, 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? It's us. It's you. And so our first spiritual SOP, our first step in overcoming conflict, is to recognize the source of all these conflicts. It comes from inside the human heart. As James says, it comes from inside you. Second step, realize the consequence. Realize the consequence. Realize the consequences of your conflicted heart. And what's that consequence? Let's look at verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose It is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so here James is addressing a Jewish audience who were very familiar with the metaphor of adultery, adulterers and adulteresses. Because in the Old Testament, there are several prophets, significant prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, who all employ this term when referring to God's people cheating on God. They were, in effect, spiritual adulterers. They were cheating on God, even though they were in covenant relationship with him. And so here's the point James is making for us. You can get to a point in striving for what you want in your life, so much so that you're not only fighting with other people and going to war with other people, but that you can find yourself fighting and going to war with God himself, whether you acknowledge it or not. Choosing to make God your enemy, ruining the relationship that you should be having with God because of your lust for personal pleasure. Just like someone will ruin their marriage by breaking their marriage vows and cheating on their spouse. And of course, God doesn't want to be our enemy. He doesn't want to be our enemy. He wants to be our friend. He wants to be our friend. Jesus said to his disciples, from now on, I don't call you my servants. I call you my friends. That's the relationship that God wants to have with us. Now, when James is writing this, he's not suggesting that they could have lost their salvation because of this, but he is suggesting that they can deeply damage their relationship with God, which has all kinds of nasty implications for their spiritual and day-to-day lives. Have you ever heard of the term carnal Christian before? Carnal Christian or worldly Christian? That comes from 1 Corinthians 
This is how Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, or as carnal, worldly people, as infants in Christ. To be a carnal Christian is to be caught between two separate spheres, between the flesh and between the spirit. It's to be caught between two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven. And we might describe a carnal Christian this way. They have enough of Jesus to be saved, but they have enough of the world in them to be miserable despite their salvation. That's what a carnal Christian looks like. They could be so much better off, so much happier, but like a spiritual fence sitter with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God, they totter back and forth between worldly pursuits and godly pursuits. This is carnal Christianity. And James maintains that this is a recipe for absolute disaster a recipe for conflict with others, and it's a recipe for conflict with God. And so he gives us this spiritual operating procedure that we might avoid this kind of conflict that brings about a break in our relationship with God, and it brings about a break between our relationship with our brothers and sisters in the world. So, first, recognize the source. Second, realize the consequence. And then the third step to overcoming conflict from James, chapter 4, Repent of your attitude. Repent. And so, in verses 7 through 10, James gives us a series of commands. Short little staccato commands. Let's take a look at those. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. And so this quick, punchy series of commands, and I'm going to jump first to verse 9 here. He says, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Not the kind of happy, happy, feel joy message that we would typically prefer. And these are all words that his audience would immediately realize describe repentance. Repentance. Turning away from what you know to be sinful as soon as you become aware that it is sinful. In 1 John chapter 1, John writes, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Revelations chapter 2 and 3, which we just recently studied in that fantastic series on Revelation, Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches. And in six of those seven letters, and these are churches like us, these are Christian churches like ours, to six of those seven churches, Jesus tells those churches to repent, 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 and repent. Six times. He tells them to repent and turn away from those worldly ambitions, those worldly values, those worldly pursuits. He tells them to repent and turn away from them because they are critically harming them, whether they're aware of it or not, and they're harming their relationship with God. This is what Jesus, of course, redresses in the Sermon on the Mount when he says that blessed are the poor in spirit, followed by blessed are those who mourn. This is the blessedness of salvation. You must first recognize that I am poor in spirit. I'm spiritually impoverished in my sin before God. I have nothing of any value that I could possibly spend on earning my way to God. I've got nothing. I'm spiritually bankrupt, and I deeply mourn that condition. It hurts. I mourn it. And Jesus said, happy. Happy or blessed are those who mourn in this way, 
Because the quickest way to joy is to mourn over what you know is standing in the way of that joy. And that, my friends, is sin. That's what stands between us and the joy we all are yearning for. So if you want to overcome conflict, you recognize the source. It's within the human heart. You realize the consequence. It hurts my relationship with God and others. You repent of your inclination toward worldliness and sinfulness. And the fourth step to overcoming conflict, resist the devil. Resist the devil. So why would James mention the devil when talking about conflict resolution? Because obviously, of course, the devil loves conflict. He was the original source of conflict. He was the original rebel. Satan started the first war in heaven and took a third of the angels with him. He wanted his way in opposition to God's way. He was the first to pray, my will be done, my kingdom come. And of course, as we just recently studied in Revelation, the devil is still there tearing things up at the end of time in the battle of Armageddon. If God is the Alpha and the Omega of all time and space, and he most assuredly is, then Satan could be called the Alpha and the Omega of conflict. He started it all, he's there at the end of it all, and he's here along with us in the middle of it all, in the midst of our elections, our school board meetings, our clashes with our coworkers and with our neighbors, stirring up conflict within our marriages and families, doing everything in his power to cause every kind of destructive conflict among us. And when we lift ourselves up, we beat our chest, we become proud, we strive to get our way above God's way, then we're following right in his footsteps. But when we resist the temptation to always be in control and to always have our own way, then we're resisting the nature and the influence of Satan in our lives. In verse 6, James says, But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And this is good news, my friends. It's good news. God is incredibly gracious. He's immensely, extensively, thoroughly gracious. But this is also some sobering news that uh, James has for us here in this verse as well. What this tells us is that if we don't resist the devil, we don't resist his temptations, we don't resist his plans of conflict in our lives, we just might find that God will resist us. Because if we don't resist the devil and we put our plans and our purposes and our selfish pursuits first, if we continue to try and elevate ourselves above others, James tells us that God will resist us. God opposes the proud. And so you're never more like the devil than when you're being proud. And you're never more like Jesus than when you humble yourself. Step four in James's SOP for us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Thank God. And then here is the fifth and final step to overcoming conflict. You ready for it? Run to God. Run to God. Notice in verses 7, 8, and 10, the, this composite compa- command that James weaves into this passage. Verse 7, submit yourselves to God. Verse 8, Draw near to God. And in verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord. Now, it's one thing to resist the devil and his temptations in our lives, but it's quite another thing to run toward God. What's that look like? What's it mean to run towards God? What's that look like in our lives? Practically speaking, how would you describe that? And so in summarizing this last point, I'll simply encourage us to pursue the most intimate relationship with Christ that we can possibly achieve. Intimacy with Jesus Christ. 
We need to pursue that. We need to run towards that. Don't settle for anything short of an intimate, personal relationship with him. To use Jesus' personal words, he said to abide in me. Maintain a close, intimate relationship with me. He said that if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Verse 7, submit yourselves to God. If you say, hey, I'm a Christian, I've given my life to Jesus. You've heard this before. You've probably, many of you have probably said that before, right? I've given my life to Jesus. The question we have to ask ourselves is, did you? <laughs> did you really? Have you really given your life to Christ? Did you hand your life over to him and say, it's yours? I'm all yours? Every area of my life, every aspect of my life? Because if you did give your life to Christ, then why would you complain when things don't go your way? If you gave your life to Christ, then why are you so jealous that somebody has something more in their life than you do? If you're wholly committed to Jesus, then that's his problem, isn't it? If you gave your life wholly to Christ, then why are you still fighting? Why are you continuing to have conflict with this world? If you gave your life to Jesus, those aren't your fights to be fought. Those are no longer your battles to win. Jesus has already won the ultimate battle on the cross. He won it. The ultimate conflict. And you've been invited to participate in and rest in that victory. Praise God. Let God be God. Let God call the shots in your life. Rest in him. Amen? And I love verse 8 here as we prepare to conclude today. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. If you go after God, he will go after you. Most of us are familiar, of course, with the story of the prodigal son, right? And so midway through that story, the prodigal son wakes up in the ruins, the absolute ruins and destruction that he's made of his life, a ruin caused by all of his selfish and sinful pursuits. And he decides to crawl back home in shame to his father's house, where he's going to beg for dad's mercy and forgiveness. And Jesus says that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And so, what Jesus is trying to communicate to us here in this story is that if you take one step toward God, he will sprint toward you. You do your feeble best to turn toward God, you crawl your way toward him, and he will run to you. That's how much he loves you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Amen? Amen. And so, cherry on the top here. As I was, I was advancing through the ranks of the army, respect, right? Advancing through the ranks of the army and preparing to go from E4 to E5. Ooh. Becoming a sergeant, getting those three stripes after my two. When I was doing that, I went into what's called a course, it's called PLDC. That's the course we did, the Primary Leadership Development Course. And there we would be trained in all of the leadership skills that would be uh, necessary for us to be effective NCOs, to be effective non-commissioned officers. And we would be tested extensively in these various skills, as again is a common phenomenon at all stages and in all branches of the military. Training and training and testing and testing. And if you failed at any of these tests, you would be considered what's called a what? No-go. You'd be a no-go and dismissed from the program. And at the end of the program was the biggest, scariest test, which again is a common theme at every stage of uh, the military. There's always this big test that everyone fears the most. Like in basic training, it was the big PT test at the end. And if you failed that, you failed basic training. And there's always some test at all the stages that's no, most notorious for eliminating the most trainees. And so here in the PLDC, the big test 
was the infamous compass course. Okay? And we trained for weeks on how to read and plot coordinates on military maps. And then how to use a compass to shoot what's called an azimuth. An azimuth. Or calculate the precise direction to go from one compass point to another. And then you would go do that physically on actual terrain. Very, very large areas filled with every kind of terrain. Plains, mountains, deserts, dense forests, swamps, all of it. And if your calculations were off even a little bit, if you drew with your projector on the map like a millimeter off, you could be off by hundreds and hundreds of meters from your coordinates and your compass points. And we learned all kinds of special techniques as we were training to do this, like one that's called boxing the obstacle, which is a technique for mathematically navigating around uns unsurpassable obstacles, like swamps or cliffs. Now, of course, there's always a lot of talk amongst the fellow trainees, stuff like, hey, they tell you to do it this way, the instructor told us to do it this way, the book tells you to do it this way, but my uncle or my buddy told me that this is a better way. It's so much better if you do it this other way. This is the unconventional wisdom. Stuff like that. And so the day before the final test, you get to do a simulated test. You have to go out and find four compass points across a massive training area. It takes all day long to do it. And on the practice day, I followed some of that unconventional wisdom I learned from the other guys. There's this one guy in the infantry, and he just seemed like he was high and tight, and he knew how to do everything, and he, was, he had all the right gear and the face paint and everything. I mean, he was, he was well put together. And I was like, okay, I'm going to follow this guy's lead. He seems to know what he's talking about. And on the practice day, I followed that, and guess what? I missed one of the compass points, and I failed the test. And I can tell you that as someone who likes to be an overachiever, <laughs> and really wanted to pass this course, that night in the barracks was incredibly tough for me. I was filled with incredible levels of anxiety, and I stayed up all night practicing with my tools, my map, my protractor, my compass. And I studied and restudied the training manual, that famous FM 325-26. I read that thing over and over again like six times all night long, and I didn't get any sleep. And the following day, the day of the test, I trusted the training and did it by the book. I followed the procedure, and I passed the compass course and graduated PLDC. Our lives are full of conflict, folks. You know what I'm talking about. There's no way around that. We're fallen people who live in a fallen world. And so, where's the conflict in your life right now? Where's your conflict? At home or at work? With family or coworkers? With your neighbors or even your enemies? With your own body? Where's your conflict? Follow the book my friends. Follow the book. Do it by the book. James has given us here in chapter 4 a spiritual operating procedure for overcoming the conflict in our lives. Recognize the source. Realize the consequence. Repent of your attitude. Resist the devil. And run towards God. Study and restudy that manual. Relax and follow the procedure. And it will surely get you where you need to go. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this incredible collection of books you provided us in the Bible. It's just so incredibly rich. As Psalm 119 celebrates, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
And as 2 Timothy 3 tells us, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We've been so blessed by this series in the book of James. And we thank you for Pastor Jeff's heart, his vision and leadership of this church, that he has selected this wonderful book for us to study and apply to our lives as a people that seek to faithfully know and do your will in this world. Lord, help us to take these spiritual operating procedures that James has provided for us here in chapter 4 and apply them to our lives in such a way that we may be a people and a community known for having overcome conflict. That pathway might be known as a church that is just overflowing with the peace of Christ. And we will give you all the praise and the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.